We're going to talk about people-centered HR. And I want to begin by showing you a video. I did not ask permission to show this video, but it's on YouTube, so I guess everybody can see it. So I want you to take a look at this video, and then I'm going to be back to you. So check it out. There's this door on the 10th floor of the Vox Media office that I hate so much. God damn it. You ever get this door wrong? Pretty regularly. Have you seen people misuse it? All the time, every day. Constantly. I hate this door. <laughs> Me too, Kelsey. But here's the thing. As soon as you start looking for confusing doors, they are everywhere. It's push. Why? I feel like Roman Mars would know about this. This is 99% invisible. And those doors you hate are called Norman doors. Um. <laughs> What's a Norman door? Don Norman wrote the essential book about design. He is the right. Norman of the Norman door. All right, and where is this guy? You must go to San Diego. Okay. Hi, Hi Joe. Hey, I'm Don Norman. I'm... Gee, you know, it's hard to describe what I am. Well, he's been a professor of psychology, professor of cognitive science, professor of computer science, a vice president of advanced technology at Apple. But for our purposes. I was spending a year in England, and I got so frustrated with my inability to use the light switches and the water taps and the doors even, that I wrote this book. If I continually get a door wrong, is it my fault? No. In fact, if you continually get it wrong, it's a good... And if other people continually get it wrong, good sign that it's a really bad door. A Norman door is one where the design tells you to do the opposite of what you're actually supposed to do, or gives the wrong signal and needs a sign to correct it. Why does it need an instruction manual? That is, why do you have to have a sign that says push or pull? Why not make it obvious? It can be obvious, if it's designed right. There are a couple of really simple, basic principles of design, and one of them I'll call discoverability. When I look at something, I should be able to discover what operations I can do. The principle applies to a whole lot more than doors. And it's amazing with many of our computer systems today. You look at it, there's no way of knowing what's possible. Should I uh, tap it once or twice, or even triple tap? So discoverability, when it's not there, well, you don't know how to use something. Another is feedback. And so many times there's no feedback. You have no idea what happened or why it happened. And these principles form the basis of how designers and engineers work today, commonly known as user or human-centered design. I decided at one point the word user was a bit degrading. Why not call people people? And it's amazingly simple and amazingly seldom practiced. We call it iterative because it sort of goes around in a circle. We go out and we observe what is happening today. We observe people doing the task. And from that, we say, oh, we have some ideas. Here's what we should perhaps propose to do. Then you prototype your solution and test it. Quite often, these are wrong at first. But each time we go around the circle, we do a better job of making the device until the point we're actually making something that really works. And this process has spread all over the world. And it turns out it's improving lives. From better everyday things like the ones that Don wrote about. To using the same process to solve huge problems in public health in developing countries. Water. Sanitation. Farming. Lots more. So what would be a better human-centered door? An ideal door is one that as I walk up to it and walk through it, I'm not even aware that I had opened the door and shut it. So if you had a door which had a flat plate, what could you do? Nothing. The only thing you can do is push. So see, you wouldn't need a sign. A flat plate, you push. This kind of push bar with the piece sticking out on one side works well too. So you can see what side you're supposed to push on. The vertical bars could go either way. A simple little hand thing though sort of indicates pull. But we still have terrible, terrible doors in the world. So many of them. There are lots of things in life that are fairly standardized and therefore whether I buy this house or not is not a function of whether it has good doors in it. And so uh, except for safety reasons, doors tend not to be improved. But the tyranny of bad doors must end. I think that it's a really sh design. In fact, they put a pull handle when it's a push. And it should be a flat panel right here. 
and that I will handle. But that's how I feel about the story. It's very misleading. I agree. You're right, Becky. You're goddamn right. And if we all thought like you, well, we might just design a better world together. It won't open because it's a security door. What the f are you two doing? Hey, so as you can see, since I started making this video, they've uh, since changed the door a little bit. Uh, I guess it's a step in the right direction. Thank you so much for watching, and to 99% Invisible, one of my favorite podcasts. It was so much fun to collaborate with them. Thank you, and check them out on any podcast app or 99pi.org. So, everybody, why is it that something as simple as utilizing or designing a door has gotten so complicated. Why? Now, I just wanted to show you that example to exemplify the fact that sometimes we make the simplest things in the world so complicated that they end up needing instructions. And like the video said, we should not need instructions to open a door, but we do need them. There's a push and there's the pull. The same thing is happening with some of the HR processes that we have in place in our organizations. Some things have to be a little bit complicated, and I understand that, but I don't know why everything has to be so complicated, right? So why is it that we are making all these things so difficult to understand, so complicated, instead of making them more intuitive? And one of the things that I want you to take away from my chat today is that one of the main tasks that we have in the world of HR to create a better workplace and to create a better society is to simplify those processes to the point that they become almost intuitive for people and that we don't have to explain to them whether they have to push or pull, but they know just by seeing something because it's common sense how they have to operate that process. Look at this uh, screen one second. Uh, this, this image, for those of you who have worked in the world of um, uh, in the world of, of design thinking and, and user-centered uh, design or user experience design, you probably have seen this image very often. It shows the design of a sidewalk versus the way people actually walk. If you look at this, if you go back to the designers and you look at the costs of this project, it probably may have cost less money for them to have built the diagonal pathway for people to walk through instead of building the other two sidewalks. And of course, we have to take into account that sometimes there are some safeguards that we have to keep in place, environmental safeguards and social safeguards, and maybe that's why they didn't build the sidewalk diagonally, but instead they build the other two sides of that small triangle in there. But in reality, many of our processes, when you think about them, they go around, around, and around instead of just building the diagonal sidewalk that people will be going through. So if you look at this, I am sure that if you had the time to sit in this of a screen with a camera looking at what people did on that little corner you would see them all the time walking through that sort of dirt path instead of walking through the sidewalks now this is not the only example of some maybe uh you know a mediocre or bad design we find this everywhere in life we find this everywhere sidewalks that go through poles uh, bike lanes that go through poles again we see this sidewalk that goes nowhere we see a door that you have to put instructions on it to see what's going on with the door if you have to push or if you have to pull. My point here is that when we think about people, when we think about a human-centered HR, we are thinking about how people operate. That's our main uh, sort of idea here. Our main uh, uh, mindset should be with empathy, thinking how do people operate? How do they behave? What do they want? And based on that, we design and not the other way around. Look at this quote that I loved. I found this yesterday and I just wanted to share this with you. We spend a lot of time designing the bridge, but not enough time thinking about the people who are going to cross it. So this is what happens. We design doors, we design sidewalks, we design bike lanes, we design workplace policies, we design HR processes, we design technology systems. 
and we only think about the process itself that we are designing, but little time do we spend thinking about the people who are going to be served either by those sidewalks or by those bridges or by those HR processes. So once again, the, one of the main takeaways that I want you to walk away with from my talk today is we got to put ourselves in the place of the designer. And when we put ourselves in the place of a good designer, not just a designer, but of a good designer, what we are going to be doing is thinking, how do people behave? How do people operate? What do they want? What, what can be intuitive for them that we need the least amount of lines of instructions for them to operate, but that they think about those processes as common sense? And this is really important. One thing that I want you to think about is, for one second, just close your eyes for one second and think about, I'm sure that you have a lot of uh, uh, manual and policies in place in your uh, in your organization. I, I'm hoping that you're not printing them out and you're saving a little bit of uh, the environment and some trees by not printing those stuff out. But for one second thing, how thick would a manual be if you printed all of your workplace policies? It's like a big, thick thing, right? Now, imagine... What could happen if you simplify those processes that you have in place via your manuals? And if you, because you are thinking of the user first and you're thinking about how to make the process intuitive for them instead of forcing them to sort of subject their behavior to what you are putting in a manual. And by the way, I don't mean to oversimplify the fact that there are laws and there are things that we have to meet, right? Legislation requirements, and those may get a little bit more complicated. But very often I have found that there's a lot that we can do in the workplace that do not require that complexity in the, in the way we are delivering those processes. So I am asking you as the main takeaway from my conversation today that you not only think about the manual, about the process, or about what makes sense for you as a service provider from the HR perspective. I am asking you to think, how can you think of people, of the people that you're serving before building the bridge? So it's not the other way around. You don't build the bridge and then see them going through the bridge by giving them instructions on how to cross it. You go the other way around. You see how they behave. You see what they want. You see what their needs are. And then you design the bridge. Because only in doing so will you be building something that makes sense for them, that will be more intuitive for them. And maybe you are going to be taking out at least half of that very thick a manual that you have built. So this is really important as the beginning of my conversation. So now the question is, has HR ever been people-centric? I mean, if you think about it, our, our name is human resources, right? We are supposed to be all about humans. Now, are we really human, a human-centered, a people-centric practice? When I talk to people in the HR space, all of them tell me, or most of them tell me, I got into this space because I love working with people. I love serving others. I find joy, enjoyment. I find a passion in serving others. But when I found this job, all I'm doing now is data entry. All I'm doing now is just hiring people and looking at resumes. All I'm doing now is you know, forcing or ensuring compliance in my organization. So they go from this very passionate level of, I want to serve others to now, I am in this tiny box, which is the only space in which I can operate. And basically what I'm doing within that space is just transactions. This is not true for all the people who work in HR because I find that a lot of them have really found their, their, their voice and creative outlet for their, for, well, for their imagination and their curiosity and their creativity. But very often in HR, it happens that we are operating within a very small box uh, bound by a lot of policies that are not intuitive, that are not common sense. So to the question, has HR ever, be, ever been people-centric? I, I say that the, the purpose and the potential that we have is to be people-centric, and that's where we should be going. But in reality, we have been more about ensuring compliance, running the transactions and the operation, and maybe, you know, serving the, the organizational leadership rather than being people-centric. So what we have done over at least 120 years or 100 years since the inception of the name personal management by the 1920s is ensuring compliance. So we have been more process-centered and policy centered than people centric. And I know some people don't like this, and I respect if you don't like it. And I, you know, I would love to have a discussion and a dialogue with you about why I think this way. But we have the 
fantastic and extraordinary opportunity to, opportunity to now build a real people-centric HR, something that I don't think we have done in many, many years. So how do we build that people-centric HR? First of all, we need to change the way we think about everything. And when I say that we need to change the way we think about everything is that we need to make sure that we understand that people-centered or human-centered or user-centered design is a mindset. I'm going to be giving you some tools today because I want you to have a framework on how to do this, but this is a mindset. And it is a mindset because when you think about the work that we do in HR, very often, it seems as if we want to build that bridge that I was talking about before. We just want to go and build the bridge because it seems that the metrics, of, the metrics of success of our work is the bridges that we're building and not how people are crossing those bridges or whether they are crossing them at all or not. So if you measure your work by the amount of bridges that you're building, by the amount of doors that you are putting together, and you don't measure your success by how easy it is for people to cross that bridge or to open that door, then you're making a mistake because then you are measuring outputs and you are not measuring outcomes. So when we think about people-centered design as being a mindset, what we're thinking about is, hey, wait a second, maybe this year I'm going to build less bridges, maybe this year I'm going to build less doors, or maybe I build the same amount of doors or the same amount of bridges, but I'm going to start from the perspective of what the users really want instead of forcing them to fit into the bridge that I think is the right bridge to build, or instead of building a door that will need instructions when it should be just a common sense kind of thing that we just open and, you know, the door, whatever, whatever way it is. So, First thing that you have to understand about design thinking is that it is a mindset. There is a process for this. As I said before, I'm going to be showing you a couple of slides about that. But, but people-centered design is most important than everything else. It is a mindset. Now, how do we do people-centered design? I'm going to show you a couple of things here that are part of my design. And one thing that is very interesting about design thinking is that it's as opposed to, for example, you know, project management, which, you know, we have the Project Management Institute, and as opposed to maybe agility, which has some framework, design thinking has been very flexible. There's no uh, governing body in the design thinking world that says like, you know, you got to do it this way or you got to do it that way. So that's why sometimes you're going to find some, uh, some uh, names for each step in the process that may be different from one you know, organization to another or from one group of experts in design thinking to another. But at the end of the day, no matter what they're called, the, the meaning is the same thing because it's not about the process. It's about the mindset that you need to embrace in order to make them happen. So let me quickly go to the process. But before, I want to say that when you're designing, as Tim Brown, CEO and president of IDEO said once, when you're designing, it is not us versus them or even us on behalf of them. For a design thinker, it has to be us with them. And this is really, really critical. There is this quote, I, I may be like totally, uh, you, know, uh, um, uh, you know, saying it wrong, but it says, what's done for me without me is against me. What's done for me without me is against me. If you're going to build a bridge in your organization, and in the design of that bridge or that door, you are not including the people that you need to include to help you in the thinking process for the design, to help you how you can make that bridge and that door the most intuitive possible so that people with common sense can cross them without having uh, to have instructions on how to do it. If you don't think about that, then whatever you're building may end up being against of them instead of for them. And folks, please don't tell me that this is not the reality of HR sometimes, that we are building stuff and those things end up being sort of the enemy of our people instead of being a way for people to find the meaning and the enjoyment and the happiness that we were talking about before. So it is not us versus them. It is not us in HR versus the employees. It is not us saying, I mean, we're building these learning programs on behalf of our people. It is how can we build these things with them? Because if we build it with them, not only are we going to have more buy-in, but we're building the bridges and the doors that make sense for our people. So I'm hoping that you're thinking about that right now. So first of all, design thinking is works best at the intersections of uh, at the intersection of complex problems and problems that affect people. When you see some uh, design thinker uh, experts out there, they call this 
intersection in there are wicked problems. They call them wicked problems. And they call them wicked problems because they are complex, but not only are they complex, they impact people. So if you have an operational problem that is a technology problem and it's complex, but it doesn't affect people necessarily, maybe design thinking may not be the best uh, approach to, to do it. Now, if you have a problem that is affecting people, but it's not complex by nature, maybe you don't need design thinking either. Design thinking works best in the intersection of complex problems and problems that affect people, or what is also called wicked problems. So I want to tell you a little bit about the sequence to, uh, to work with design thinking. The first thing that you think about is empathy. And this is the most important thing. Remember what I said before, design thinking is not a process necessarily, it's a mindset. It requires some framework. Of course, you know, we, we need some fra framework to, uh, to design a process, but it is a mindset to begin with. And in that mindset, we need to embrace humanity. We need to embrace empathy. And this is very important for HR because we're supposed to be all about empathy, all about humanity, all about you know, tolerance, all about understanding others. If we embrace that mindset that we are not always right in HR, but it, and it is not us versus them or us on behalf of them, but us with them, only then are we going to be able to say, how do we better understand the sufferings from our people in this organization? I want to give you one example of that, that uh, I, I was told yesterday. There was this um, uh, barista, you know, working in a coffee shop, and she shared the story of how she, she's, she has an MBA, she's been applying for jobs, and she was called for an interview. So, you know, she was very excited about the interview. You know, I'm excited about the interview. I want to go to the interview and whatnot. 10 minutes before the interview, HR calls her, human resources calls her and says, I'm sorry, but we are not going to interview you because you don't qualify for this job. 10 minutes before the call was scheduled. At the time of the interview, at the time that the interview was scheduled, she got a call from the hiring manager, which is not, it's not from HR. And the person says, we are very excited about you. You know, we want to bring you on board. And she says like, I'm sorry, but no. You know, I was just told that I don't qualify for this job. So I don't want it anymore. This is a, a, young, a, a young person. So. Imagine the pain that such a person can go through when not only she's trying to get a job that she likes, but she's told 10 minutes before the interview, after all the excitement, that she doesn't qualify for that job. She was told that by HR. So if we're not able to think with empathy about these things, then we're making a mistake. Because if we don't serve our people, our customers, our internal customers, and our potential internal customers, which are the candidates that are applying for the jobs that we have available, if we don't think about them, with empathy, then we won't be able to do any design thinking at all. So I am, what I'm telling you right now is that if you don't embrace the mindset of empathy and understand how your people operate, how they behave, what they want, what they need, if you don't start from there, it doesn't matter how good you are in the other steps of the design thinking process. It's going to go wrong because you've got to start with understanding what people feel. And what this means is that sometimes you're going to hear people saying, your HR process sucks. You know, your HR processes suck. I mean, they don't deliver value. They are not doing what, they, what we need them to do for the organization. You need to work on them. So instead of thinking like, how is this possible? How is it possible that this person is telling us that our processes are not working? Instead of thinking that, maybe you go back and think like, oh, you know what? It is because we build the bridge without asking them, uh, you know, uh, and considering them before building that bridge. Or it is because we added, you know, 10 pages of instructions to how, on how to open the door instead of just making it, make, making it as intuitive as possible. So we start with empathy. Empathy means thinking about the problems that are affecting people in the organization and in the way those problems are making people's lives miserable and uncomfortable. And I, I, love, I love to use that word, miserable, because I, I am a nature practitioner as well, like you. I, I practiced HR for a long time before you know, switching out to, um, to hacking HR. And, and I know several of our processes that were miserable and performance management being one of them. I don't believe in the performance man management based, uh, that is based on rating, rating system and that is delivered on an annual basis. I, I, don't, I don't believe in it. Some people do. I don't believe in it. I think it's, it is a painful process that makes people's lives miserable. Because if you do great work every day, and maybe the day 364, you make a, you make a small mistake, then you're going to be told, oh, you know, your performance was not as good. Because that one day you made a mistake instead of the other 364 days when you were doing great. Or maybe 
you are not doing that great and you need support from your leadership, but you're not getting it because they're waiting. Hey, you know what? I cannot provide feedback because I got to wait for the performance management and the, the feedback is going to come in a written form and it's not even going to come in a conversation. So those processes like that make people's lives miserable. So think about that when you are uh, trying to implement design thinking. Now let's go to the next phase. So once you start with empathy uh, and this mindset, you go to definition. Definition is defining the problems that the organization may have. And so you may need to tackle, if, especially if you are starting in your journey for design thinking or for people-centered design, you may want to think about how to tackle uh, you know, the most important and urgent problems. I know that in the metrics of priorities, we always want to think about going to the to the non-urgent important things but sometimes when you are starting in the process of designing or utilizing design thinking you may want to go to the problems that are that are not only complex and affect people but that are urgent and important and then you may be able to break those problems down in smaller pieces one thing that i have seen in hr and you guys may be um you know i, I don't know if you have you've had the same experience that that i have but one thing that i i'm an engineer and I also, you know, my background is engineering and HR. So this is funny because in HR, what happens is that very often people want to de develop solutions end to end. What that means is that before, it's, it's like, imagine this. Imagine people, imagine HR people building a bridge and they don't want to show you anything of that bridge. They have all, you know, scaffolded around and, you know, it's all covered up and they only show you the bridge when it is fully built. So maybe by the time they, open the bridge to everybody else. Somebody else says like, hey, what a second. There's a little problem over there with that bridge, but the bridge is already built up. So there's, now you have spent all these resources and all this time into building that bridge, but then the bridge ended up having problems. So that happens very often in HR, that we want to build the bridge end to end before asking people whether what we're doing makes sense or not. In engineering, it's a little different because in engineering, you don't build a product end-to-end -end and then deliver it. What you do is you build smaller pieces of that product and you start testing them out and you start experimenting and you start uh, innovating and you start ideating. So when you do that in engineering, what you are doing is optimizing the way you utilize your, your resources and you're optimizing the feedback that you get from each iteration process. And this is really important, really, really important in design thinking and agility. It is important because when we put together HR processes, we don't want to design something end to end that's going to take us six months to design and then put it out there. We instead want to deliver smaller pieces and continue to build up the bigger thing instead of trying to build a big thing to only find out that it doesn't work the way we had initially thought that it was going to uh, was going to work. Uh, um, but you know, it's really important that you consider this because I don't want you to guys go through you know redesigning your performance management process and thinking, oh my goodness, my goodness, we are designing the best performance management process in the world, and then you put it up there and your business leaders are like, dude. That's not good. I mean, I, that's, that doesn't work. That doesn't work for me. Or the people saying like, oh my God, this, here comes HR again with another thick manual to tell me how to do things. Go the other way around. Define the problem, break it down in smaller pieces that you can manage. Now, once you have that with empathy, you started the process of identifying problems. You define the problem. Now you start the ideation process. And in ideation, what you do is you try to get as many ideas as possible from as many people as possible, even beyond HR. And this is really important. I love the concept of cross-pollination of ideas. We got to get out of the HR bubble to be able to get many more solutions that we think are possible. So you ideate. And by ideation, what I mean is bringing as many ideas as possible to solve those problems that we identify, that we defined in the definition step and that we identified in the empathy step. And now you move on to prototyping. But this is critical here. Imagine that you have one problem and the problem is whatever it is. And then you ideated, I'm going to say, you know, 100 solutions. Everybody set a solution. Of course, you can't do them all because that's going to be impossible for you to do them all. You're going to have to prioritize the ones that make more sense and the ones that can be easily implementable and that can be cheap to prototype. So just put those ideas out there. you got 100 ideas and you say, you know what? These three or four are the ones that make the most amount of sense. So you try to put them together in a prototype. Once you put a prototype, basically what you're doing is testing 
what makes sense, what really delivers value to people. So look at this for one second. You started from identifying problems with empathy. And because design thinking is a mindset and not a process, you start with thinking, what is making my people's lives miserable? What is making them uncomfortable? What is preventing them from reaching their potential? What is preventing them from finding meaning, joy, and happiness at work? Then once you identify th those problems, you define them in a way that makes sense. Sometimes that definition may be very complex, but you break it down into smaller pieces that are manageable. Now you move on to the ideation process. You select one of those problems and you say, this one is urgent and it's important and we're going to solve it right now. And this problem is complex and affects people. So design thinking is a perfect solution to, uh, or it's a, it's, a, it's a perfect mindset and process to solve this problem. Now you start ideating solutions. And when you are ideating solutions, you get as many solutions from as many people as you can. Now you move on to the prototyping step or phase. Now what you do is you say, you know what, we have 100 solutions, but we can't implement them all. We're going to take these two or three things that makes that make the most amount of sense and we are going to develop prototypes and we're going to put them on there uh, out there and now we are going to test what makes sense or not now once you you test your prototypes what what's going to happen is that you will find out the ideas that do not work. You're going to find out the ideas that work so-so. You're going to find out the ideas that work very well. And maybe you go back to your design board, to your design table with your team, and you start thinking, you know what? This idea didn't work. These two work. You know, okay, let's combine some of the things that we learned and let's put another idea out there to continue prototyping and testing. Once you come up with the final idea that makes sense in HR for your HR processes, now you are in a great place where you can scale up. And by scaling up, what I mean is you take that idea and you implement it throughout the organization. Let me tell you something about design thinking, which people always ask me. Um, this is not an easy thing to do. And by that, what I mean is people always ask me, how much time is that going to take? Well, it's not going to take one day if that's what you're expecting to hear. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you want this to take one day, then don't do it. Just, just force the solution on people. Just design something in your own mind, you know, put it in a manual and put it out there and continue to make the same mistakes, meaning continue to build the door with the instructions that do not make sense and continue to make the process as, as least intuitive as possible, as least common sense as possible and continue to have a workforce that is totally disconnected from your processes because they don't find that they can be themselves or that they those processes in any way reflect what they want, what they need, the way they operate. Now, if you want the alternative to that, it's going to take some energy, it's going to take some time, it's going to take some resources, especially time and, you know, passion and energy. But the buy-in, the long-term sustainability and the possibilities for this processes to deliver real value is way higher than those processes that you will be forcing upon people. So design thinking takes time. Design thinking, it's a mindset. It takes time to deliver, but it is way more powerful than just forcing solutions on people. There's a canvas that I'm going to go pretty quickly through. It's uh, to help you out. Um, this is what I was talking about before. It's in a canvas, so this is going to be available to you. I just posted it yesterday on my LinkedIn. So you design the team. You think about the big challenges that you have, and you break down those problems. You define, ideate, prototype, test, and scale. So this canvas hopefully help you out, helps you out to, uh, you know, put some of the some of the ideas together in a way that makes sense to uh, for your analysis and for the work. So. Um, once again, as I, as I mentioned before, people-centered design, you understand what people need, how they think and behave, and then you incorporate that understanding into every, into every aspect of your HR process. This is really, really important because as I mentioned before, if you try to build a bridge or build the doors before asking people or, or observing how people operate, how they behave and what they want, you're going to be making a mistake. And it's the same mistake that we have made for a number of years from the HR perspective, from the HR function. So you got to start from a different perspective. And the different perspective is the perspective of understanding what people want, what people need, and how they operate. Now, there are obstacles, of course. Design thinking, you know, it sounds beautiful, right? Everybody might, might be saying like, wow, you know, sounds fantastic. Then, you know, if it's so great, why, why isn't everybody doing it? Because there are obstacles to this. And as I said before, you know, it, it takes time, it takes energy, but I want to show you some of the obstacles. One of them is probably you. 
And this is really important that you consider because often I have found people trying to either implement a design thinking solution or trying to utilize design thinking, but the main obstacle to implement a design thinking mindset and process in their organization is themselves. Because first of all, it requires a new way of thinking. Second, it requires embracing the problems that people are saying with empathy. And second, it requires some iteration and some extra work that goes beyond just telling people what to do. So if we are not able, and this ties back to what I said before, if we're not able to change our mindsets in the way of uh, we, we design HR processes, if we don't embrace design thinking as a process, uh, as a mindset, I'm sorry, uh, we won't be able to implement any solution. So maybe the main obstacle could be you. I don't know. I hope not. Uh, the second obstacle could be the leaders of the organization, that maybe they don't see the value in this. Maybe they think, you know what? Why are you going to take so much time into doing this? Just go, just, just like design something and put it in the manual and tell people like, hey guys, this is what you got to do. Well, as I said before, you know, if that's a path in which you want to continue walking through, then you're going to continue dealing with very severe uh, workforce and workplace challenges like disengagement, uh, lack of, pro uh, uh, lack of perf low performance, lack of productivity. It's going to be very difficult for you to attract and retain great talent. So your selling point to your leaders is, well, maybe this take a little bit of extra time, but if we do it this way, we're going to be able to deliver a solution that truly delivers value and solves a lot of the problems that we have in this organization from the people perspective. Maybe it is resources. And I understand that, uh, you know, resources very often, especially for small to medium sized organizations, uh, take, uh, take, you know, it's, it's, they, are, they have constraint, you know, resource constraint. So you don't need a lot to, to do this time thinking. Uh, you need a little bit of time. You may need a little bit of money, but you can start very small and then you can sell those ideas to the leadership and say, hey guys, look what we did with design thinking. Look the result that we have achieved with design thinking. Maybe it is time. And as I mentioned before, well, you know, there are two ways to think about this. One of them is you embrace the design thinking mindset and it's going to take a little bit of extra time, or you just, uh, you know, uh, implement solutions in the same way that you've always done it, and they may take way more uh, time at the end of the day because you're going to have to be redoing those solutions over and over again. So I call them, I call this the three plus one difficulties because initially there were three and I added one more. One of the difficulties is where and how to begin design thinking. The second difficulty is, is it possible to divert resources? money and time from the busyness of the day-to-day -day operation into the design thinking and agility work. And this were the first three difficulties, how to convince the organization's leaders that design thinking is truly useful. The last difficulty that I added very recently because I found out that sometimes it is not about where to begin, how to begin. It is not about diverting resources. It is not about convincing leaders. It is more about mindset is, you know, how do we change the way we think? to embrace uh, design thinking. So this is how I believe we can solve some of these uh, difficulties. I wanna show you the, the, the chart on the left, I'm gonna show it later. Um, is it possible to divert resources from the business of the day to day operation to use design thinking and agility? I think the best way to resolve this uh, challenge and this, this difficulty is by collaborating with others. And remember, in design thinking, it is not, not us against them, or not us in, on behalf of them, it is us with them. So it is us bringing people on board to work together and collaborate and integrate other business units into the work that we're doing. And finally, how do we convince organizations, leaders that the same thinking is truly useful? Well, we gotta do the work of connecting the initiatives that we have in design thinking with business outcomes and providing ROI. Some business leaders really, really think about their people as in people and not as in numbers. Meaning, they, when you come to them and you say, we can improve people's engagement by this percentage if we do this one thing, for them, that will be a great and powerful selling point. Some others will say, how much is that going to improve our productivity and our bottom line? Bottom line. And maybe for that, you're going to need to transform your design thinking strategy into some numbers that make sense for, that, for those uh, people in the, in the business leadership uh, of your organization. So where to begin was the first question of all this, of the three difficulties. And I want to show you this graph that I created. It's just about where 
the sweet spot of a design thinking of an HR design thinking initiative is. is. First of all, we, we have complex problems that affect people. Those are normally HR problems. Then we think about the problems that can be solved the fastest, and then we think about the problems that have the most amount of impact in the organization. So when you ask yourself the question, where to begin, where to begin the journey of design thinking, this is it, folks. This is it. This is what you're going to think. You're going to go back to your desk today or tomorrow or whenever you go to work, and then you're going to think, wait a second. I'm going to make a list of the problems that are complex and that are affecting our people. I'm going to make a list of the problems that can be solved the fastest. And I'm going to make a list of the problems that, that once they are resolved, will have the most amount of impact in the organization. And once I combine all those things, all of those three buckets, I'm going to come up with a list of five things. And those five things are the sweet spot for an HR initiative. Not always, not always, but this is, this is a response to the question where to begin. Eventually, you're going to come to the place where, you know what? We, are, we don't care anymore about how fast we can solve this problem as long as the solution can be sustainable in time. Maybe you're going to come to the point where you're going to think, maybe this, now we have solved all of the other problems, now we can dedicate some time to some solution that has some impact in the organization. Whatever it is, at the very beginning of utilizing a design thinking process in your organization, this intersection of these three buckets could be very, very useful for you. Now, keep in mind the following. It is about them and for them. The closer to the end user's needs uh, are analyzed and answered, the more successful the adoption or purchase of a solution will be. You iterate until you get it right from a customer perspective, and your customers are your people, your internal people. This is the power of human-centered design. And this is all connected, right? All that I've been saying here is all connected. When we understand how people's needs our work, what they want, what they need, how they operate, when we analyze them and we answer them through design thinking, then we are into something really powerful in the organization because we are going to be designing the kind of bridges and the kind of doors that will not only truly add value and serve people, but they will also need the least amount of instructions for them to be able to meet the requirements of those processes. This is a challenge. This is a challenge. I, I think it is critical for you to put yourself on the shoes of your people. Imagine if you were being the one served by th those processes. You would think like, oh my goodness, why, why is this so thick, this manual? I mean, why do I have to go through all those steps if it should be as easy as opening or pushing the door? You know what I'm saying? So it is all about thinking how people operate with empathy. This is a mindset, people. This is not a process. It, is, it has a framework that you got to think through when you utilize this thing thinking, but it is a mindset before everything else. So you, I want to uh, close my presentation. I only have a few minutes by asking you to, when you go to utilize this thing thinking, that you also understand the context in which your organization is operating, the way your, your people operate. Remember that it's all about them. It is all about serving them in the best way possible. That you also think about how you can utilize technology at the end of the process. Very important, people. Do not bring technology at the beginning of the process because you're going to mess up the entire process. When you think about empathy as the, as the cornerstone of this process, you begin by analyzing problems and by finding solutions that maybe are tech uh, less tech-oriented, and then you implement technology to help you optimize and amplify those solutions. You don't start the other way around because you are going to be making a big mistake. And then you also need to think about how your work is operating. Just to end my conversation today, I got a couple of things to say. Um, part of the work that we need to do in implementing successful design thinking strategies is also embracing a number of extra capabilities that will be um, very important for the work that we do in HR. I I have been saying for at least the past couple of years that to do great HR work today, we need to learn non-HR stuff. To do great HR work today, we need to learn non-HR stuff. And what that means is that we need to embrace a number of capabilities, skills, knowledge, information that is at the periphery or that are at the periphery of the, of the HR bubble, but they impact 
the work that we do in HR dramatically. The traditional HR function has been about compensation, labor relationships, maybe a little bit of uh, leadership, maybe some onboarding compliance, maybe some organizational design, and possibly some strategy. But that's not enough anymore. We got to continue doing that, of course, because that's part of our operation. But that's not enough anymore. We need way more than that. And what we need to embrace is the thinking of digital transformation, design thinking and agility, how we can utilize technology applications. What are some of the emerging and disruptive technologies out there that can be helpful for our organizations? How the future of work and future trends may affect the work that we're doing because then we can combine the empathy that we, are, that we have to understand the people, people's needs and the, what they want and what they need with future trends, and we can come up with an amazing solution. We need to understand data analytics, ethics, marketing, innovation, organizational design, politics, politics, like the real politics out there, and policy, because all of those things will impact the solutions that we are designing with design thinking. This is really, really important, uh, 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 friends connecting from all over the world. And finally, I want to give you some steps to think about when you go back to your uh, organization. First of all, the time to act is right now. We can continue putting off the idea of redesigning our processes to serve our people better. And this is why there are 7 million job openings in the United States. But there are a lot of people looking for jobs. So something's going on in there. And the crisis of disengagement is not getting any better. We have anywhere between 50 and 70% of the workforce in the United States disengaged. And this number is not too different in other countries, around the same number. So we, can, we can't continue putting off the idea of finding solutions for the complex problems that our organizations are going through. And we can't continue to think that the way in which we resolved these problems in the past is the same way that we can continue solving those problems into the future. As Albert Einstein said once, we can solve the problems that we created with the same mindset that we had when we created them. We need to embrace a new mindset. Co-create the HR, uh, the future of HR with others. Remember, this is a complex, we have complex problems and design thinking will be sucking up some resources. Bring people from other teams that can help you out, see what may be invisible for you. Bring people from other or, um, departments or other business units that can help you see what may be invisible for you. Technology will be an enabler, but you put people first. Design thinking is about putting people first. Then you bring technology, not the other way around. If you are right now thinking about bringing technology, but you have not redesigned your processes, you're making a mistake. Go the other way around. Design your, redesign your processes first and then bring technology. Embrace a mindset of experimentation, risk-taking, creativity, innovation, open-mindedness, and agility. For 100 years, we were told in HR, you guys got to do hiring, firing, and paying. It's all you got to do. And now we're being told, you got to be innovative, creative. You got to use your imagination. You got to take risk. It's difficult. I know. It's like telling somebody like, riding a bike is the most dangerous thing in the world. And then telling them, now you got to go compete in the bike races out there in the world. That's, that's how it works, right? So you got to change your you know, your muscles, your mental muscle to embrace this new reality, but we got to do it. Inform your decisions with data. This is, this is critical uh, that we inform our decisions with data. And finally, embrace a, 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 a digital mindset. What that means is embrace a mindset of fast-paced changes, fast-paced innovation, uh, fast-paced collaboration, because this world is very complex and we need more of this kind of speed. I'm right on top of my time, and even though I am the event organizer, I'm going to do and be ruled by the same rule that everybody else is ruled in this event. I want to thank you all for joining my session today. Uh, coming up in half an hour, we have Professor Dave Ulrich talking about the future of HR. Please stay connected. We're going to be using the same link. And if you want more information about the same thinking, if you want to bring me on board to your organization to help you out think through some of these things, just email me. I'm always available to you. So